Right. Good evening, all. Hello, wherever you are. Good morning, good evening, good day. Uh, it's okay weather here in Burgundy. Um, we had quite a lot of rainfall on Friday morning, again, Friday night. Maybe had a little bit uh, first thing this morning as well. Um, but uh, picking in the Cote and Bone is coming to an end and uh, Cote and getting underway. Uh, we still have to wait and see what it means, but clearly it's going to be a good vintage. Uh, at the moment, in the Cote de Bone, it looks as though people are more excited by the whites than the reds, but they think they're basically going to be very good. So greetings all of you from wherever you're coming from, do let us know. And also, um, this is going to be, um, I hope, quite an interesting topic, but I'm going to be talking to you for, for an hour or so, uh, non-stop, so do please break up uh, the flow a little bit with either chat on the side or questions uh, on the Q&A uh, and that will I hope bring out some more interesting stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Burgundy pricing, how it's got to where it is and what we can expect going forwards and perhaps in particular in relation to 2019 vintage coming up. It's too early to know what growers are going to do uh, and it isn't just a question of the price X sellers from the producer. It's also a question of what happens to it in the marketplace later on. So what I thought that I would do is give a little bit of a historical background as to how Burgundy pricing has evolved in a timeline since I started getting involved professionally in wine and Burgundy. And then after that, uh, we will move through to the present day, how people set their prices, what happens to the prices in the marketplace afterwards, and what we can expect from 2019, and do we think it's gonna be a, um, a good prospect? Right, so when I started, it was still the case that the negations pretty much led the way. Um, so typically what they did was they bought and they sold according to uh, the stocks that they had in their sellers. Um, sort of a, they wouldn't have used the word algorithm in those days, but nonetheless is what they had. So a really good vintage, for example, which they had bought and then two years later they started to sell, or more than two years later, they would put it out at the price they bought it at plus the usual margin and it was a good vintage and got good press and it would sell through very quickly. So that would be a case in point, for example, with 1978. So then the money men behind the negotiations look at their uh, books and say, uh, help, our sales are high and our stock is low, so we'd better buy lots and lots and lots of the next vintage. So they bought really heavily and at high prices in 1979, which is a good vintage, but not comparable to 78. And sales doubtless slowed down because people didn't want to pay more money for a bigger crop that was less good. So the money men looked at their books again and said, this time our sales are lower than they were, and our stocks are much higher, so we better not buy the next vintage. And in fact, the next vintage, 1980, one noted negociant even made a speech in New York saying that nobody should buy this uh, vintage at all because the wines were no good. So broadly speaking, it was a question of supply and demand more than quality, which defined which direction prices were going. And then from in the 1980s and increasingly, the domains got into the game and now are a very significant part of Burgundy trading, uh, particularly at the upper end. Um, and you can make too much of this, um, but nonetheless, in general, Burgundy growers uh, look on the, uh, wine as, a, as sort of an annual agricultural product, uh, and they tend to vary their prices more in terms of the volume that they have in their cellar so that they can get a reasonably standard income um, rather than the perceived quality of the wine. That's to say that's how uh, they were looking at it, um, but uh, things have evolved clearly since then. So typically, the grower's way of looking at it, prices didn't evolve all that quickly. If anything, there was a slow but minor upward trend. And if there were any bumps, it was to do with having a short crop and needing to recoup and the negotiation pricing tended to vary rather more. Um, but you didn't have on-premier sales in those days. At some point or other, uh, the producer would communicate a price to the importer, who would only pay after he had imported the wine, and at that point, the 
release or later on would release wine to his customers. But during the 1980s, people began uh, in the UK at any rate to start thinking about doing a few tastings of the vintage. Uh, just found my, my notes of a company called Heyman Brothers tasting of Burgundy and September 1986, it was the 1983 vintage and it had a whole load of um, uh, really very exciting wines. Um, you could have brought, bought some Arkansas for £200 a dozen and uh, I did buy it because it was absolutely outstanding at the tasting. Let's see if I can find my note. Uh, the Echezo from Montjean Minoret, which in the end came in at £188 a dozen. Uh, and that every one of those old bottles was gorgeous. Anyway, that's by the by. But what's starting to happen now is that uh, UK merchants are beginning to offer in the spring, um, one and a half springs, <laughs> one and a half years after the harvest, they're beginning to offer the new vintage um, with the wines will just about to be bottled but not shipped at this point. And then if somebody was doing it in March, somebody else did it in February, someone doing it in February, somebody else did it in January. And in due course, not immediately, but at some point in the 1990s, early 1990s, uh, the UK Burgundy trade decided to make January the month for the Burgundy offer. And with Christmas being very busy beforehand, that stopped people trying to um, steal a march on the others. And as soon as everybody came back from their Christmas vacation, then the new vintage of Burgundy would be offered. All the merchants about the same time, they all started putting on tastings pretty much during the same week in January. So the growers would come over and uh, they would move, if they had several importers, as many do in Burgundy, they would move from uh, one event to another over two or three days. And both the press and the wine buying public who were interested would come along and taste these young wines, um, either barrel samples or just bottled. Uh, and that really kicked off an excitement. And we, <sighs> casually, it got called en primeur. It's not really en primeur in the same way that Bordeaux is, because in Bordeaux, not only do you have to make your choice early, and it's earlier, so it's in the spring, uh, late spring after the harvest, as opposed to uh, about nine months later. Um, not only do you have to make your choices then as a merchant, but you also have to start paying in the slices from then on. Whereas in Burgundy, you cut the deal with the producer as to what you want, how much you want, what you're going to have to pay for it, but you actually pay later on normally. I mean, different people have slightly different ways of doing it. But we call it on primaire, but it's, it's in any case the opening offer. So that begins to get uh, established. The 1990s is the decade when Burgundy really starts to come to the fore. Um, Plenty of merchants begin to specialise in it rather more and uh, it having been the, the ugly duckling, uh, um, the Cinderella to mix my metaphors, um, which everybody was being nasty about, suddenly it becomes the go-to region. Hasn't yet spread worldwide perhaps, but it's on the way. Uh, now people are beginning to see that proper wine is coming out of Burgundy and that the pricing isn't too horrible. So. Um, the 1990s were reasonably stable, apart from one moment, which was the Gulf War, 93, um, 94, when pricing completely collapsed. People were trying to sell their 92 Burgundies, and I remember, for, which is a good vintage white Burgundy, for example, but Massa was a real struggle. Of course, in those days, France was still on francs, and broadly, you had um, people who had been selling at um, 40 francs a bottle or the better ones were selling at sort of 60 to 80, and the top ones were selling at 100, 120. The people who were at 120 maybe had to come down to 100. The people who were at 80 to 100 came down to 60, um, so a little bit below the bottom part of that bracket. People who had been at 40 odd just couldn't sell their wine at all, even at 20 francs, there was no interest for it. It was a real struggle. We'd never seen that since. We didn't see that in the global financial crisis uh, when prices remained stable. Um, and we haven't yet seen it in the pandemic plus global politics uh, becoming quite exciting um, issues of the moment. Um, so that was the down point, uh, though conversely, 95 and 96, which at least at the outset were both sort of as good vintages, 
were offered very uh, inexpensively by the French because France came out of recession a little bit later than most other countries, certainly later than the UK and I think the US, uh, which meant they were being offered cheaply. The exchange rates uh, were against France at that moment. And so they really were uh, a bargain. Anyway, things stabilized, um, a mini recession uh, at the beginning of uh, what, 2001, 2002, nothing too dramatic. And, uh, and then go going on from there, uh, we arrive at the year I think of as the turning point, which is 2005. And the reason I think of it as a turning point is because it was an absolutely first rate vintage and everybody was calling it that way. And it was a time when communications had started to change dramatically. So if we go back to the 90s and certainly way before then, in the 90s, your merchant would communicate to you probably with a paper offer, um, maybe by telephone. Um, and uh, you as a consumer, you may be bought from two or three merchants, but probably you didn't play the field more than that. You might only have bought from one. You'd wait for the office to come in, you'd have a think, and you'd place an order or not. Uh, and, and so it would happen. And there was no great feeding frenzy. And even though you could, if you wanted to, check out what different people, were, how different people were pricing the wines, it wasn't transparent in the way that it's become when everything's online. So um, equally, it's true that the merchants used to buy for stock. They would say, we believe in this wine, we will buy it. And then in due course, possibly early on, possibly later, we will sell this wine very old fashioned way of doing business and different merchants have their specialities. By 2005, various things have happened. So it's a fabulous vintage. Uh, many, many more people uh, are interested in buying the wines worldwide. Asia is beginning to wake up to what Burgundy is all about. You're getting professionals in the grey market uh, side of things. Uh, quite a lot was going to various small regional um, importers and distributors in Europe, bought a three-star restaurants around the place, and quite often it was going back out of, out of the back door, across to London, and from London it would get distributed elsewhere in the world. Um, you also had various high-profile things. Daniel Jones has begun his La Pole in New York. Um, the film Sideways had come out. Um, you're beginning to get wine investment funds. A notable one in the UK was established in 2003. Um, and you've now also got things like, I don't think we had Livex yet, but uh, yes, Livex from 2000, Cellar Tracker 2003, Wine Searcher, important, 1999. And through these ver various vehicles, you could actually see what uh, comparative pricing was. Not only that, in Burgundy, you have a very small volume of any given wine available for sale. And it may well be that you don't have multiple people offering it. And in Bordeaux, you can establish a clear market price because in Bordeaux, um, if you've got 10, 15, 20,000 cases to sell at any given moment, even quite a few years after the vintage has, has been released, you're going to have a lot of people with stock available. So if somebody pops their head above the parapet and invents a much higher price, it's not going to work because people will just buy from other people at lower prices. In Burgundy, if there's only one person offering a very particular cuvee from a grower who's just becoming sought after, they can put a price which is way higher than what the opening price was. And people may look at it and think, wow, is that the new market price? I better get some. If it's going out that quickly, I, I better get in what I can. So that was definitely happening. Uh, I saw some things which you know I felt should have been uh, you know, 100 pounds a bottle being sold at 500 pounds a bottle, even during the 2005 campaign. Um, I've just actually looked earlier today at um, the, I was working at Berry Brothers in those days, and I looked at the difference between the 2004 and 2005 opening offers. Um, I would have been responsible for both of them. And two things stand out. The difference in price between what was a fairly modest vintage and what's a great vintage was only 10% at the lower end, as it might be the Macaws, the Chablis, the Bourgogne's, and rising to 15% for Good Villages, Premier Cruise, and more than that, maybe 30% for the Grand Cruise. But still not truly extraordinary. But it was also the first year in which uh, almost all the Grand Cruise or the other very top wines 
were being sold in six packs for the first time, as the 2004s were being listed by 12 and the 2005s by six. So already there's the feeling that even if you want the wine, it's going to be hard to get it uh, to you in the volume that you wish to order. So that was a, uh, a turning point. Um, and because the market is going upwards, if somebody sees a price, they're inclined to price it higher than that to get the extra money rather than lower than that in order to get the sale. So you're getting this um, almost uh, vicious spiral of upward pricing. You've also got a change in how merchants work. So they are communicating online, uh, whether it's by email to their customers or uh, sending their offers electronically, therefore that much more quickly, or indeed um, by uh, putting their prices up online so everybody can see them. But you're beginning to come to a period, though it, this may have come in a little bit later, you're getting towards the period in which merchants take a position, but they want to buy in order to sell immediately. People have become much more reluctant to hold stock. So the, there's a lot more sort of gainsmanship going on and a lot less being a, a classic wine merchant. Um, Bordeaux at this time suffers adversely from the transparency of prices because a lot comes on the market at exactly the same moment. Every merchant, importer, distributor has got to make up their mind immediately, uh, effectively put their money down. Um, and then they start panicking in certain vintages that maybe they're not going to be able to sell it through. So you've actually got to race to the bottom. Everybody's cutting margins. And very soon after this time, it's getting difficult to make even 10% on your initial on primaire sales, whereas Burgundy is quite a bit more. Um, I, to almost the last one I got involved in at Berry Brothers, the sales between Burgundy and Bordeaux on primaire in the same year for the same vintage were uh, three times as high for Bordeaux than for Burgundy but the uh, gross profit of the business was pretty similar. Um, so Burgundy has been clearly, even, even a few years back, was working in a different way to how Bordeaux works. Um, so now, of course, we get much more uh, chat. It's not just the experts, but everybody has got their WhatsApp group or WeChat or bulletin boards or whatever else. So there is a huge amount of um, consumer to consumer information going on plus from expert to consumer if you like you've got the specialist um, press you have Berghound, you have my inside burgundy uh, you've got uh, also um, some platforms who've got their own burgundy correspondent as the wine advocate and famous uh, Jancis and so on and so forth um, so it is becoming much easier to get outside information on what you might want to buy as opposed to just um, taking the merchant's word for it, that this is a really good wine this year. You'd be crazy not to have it in your cellar. So from here on in, the prices really start to rise for the top wines uh, because they are very scarce. As you know, Grand Cru's account for no more than 2%, probably slightly less of production in Burgundy. Um, and you can add to that some really top Premier Cru's, but that's the same volume again. That's only very, very minor amount of what Burgundy produces. And these are the wines which have become super sought after. Um, it's complicated to have a marketplace when there is too much different, um, too many different options around. Bordeaux is much easier. You can just look up, these are the top vintages. These are the top 20 chateaus, job done. But even if you're to limit yourself to the top 20 producers in Burgundy, they're making 15 wines or maybe more uh, each, uh, and so it becomes a slightly more complicated game. So it's harder to have a definitive market, and it's much harder to be able to establish a clear market uh, place price. And I think if I have a regret, it's that perhaps too many people have been taking the face value of EG Wine Searcher as market uh, for wines. and interesting to see, we're going to come on to the current circumstances a little bit later on, interesting, interesting to see how that will uh, develop. So um, we've come through 2005. Um, I actually just checked, I found a document with our um, purchase pricing 
2007 was offered and 2008 were offered at the same prices or higher than 2006. So effectively, the global financial crisis didn't really affect Burgundy. Now, none of those vintages is regarded as a top year. So of course, sales were uh, below the feeding frenzy for 2005. But nonetheless, the campaigns were pretty successful. And certainly Bordeaux on Primaire tends to be um, uh, all or nothing. It tends to be either a huge success or bouncing along the bottom. Um, and then al along comes 2009, lots of fuss, buzz for that to begin with. 2010, not initially uh, famous. Uh, I'm doing a, a Zoom with 67 Power Mile on the Reds uh, on Monday night. Um, so please join us for that. Uh, however, 2010 very soon did begin to get a, a cachet of its own and is now, for many people, regarded as superior vintage to 2009. But you then get a little bit of an interregnum, um, the, the difficult years or the transition years. Uh, 2011's all right, but 12, 13, 14, a little bit, 15, and certainly 16. These are the years when global warming, which has thus far seen to be, appeared to be the vigneron's friend, suddenly becoming the enemy, because I think we can ascribe it to global warming you get a, a series of years in which there is some major weather event in the modern terminology, which uh, damages the crop. So heavy hailstorms in 12, 13 and 14, the after effects of them limiting the crop in 15, and then the um, pretty catastrophic frost in 16. And in fact, frost risk in every year since then, uh, 17, 18, 19, 20, sometimes a few areas have got hit and sometimes they haven't. Um, in those subsequent years. But we were beginning to think, how on earth uh, is it going to be possible to go on making wine if we're going to have some climatic catastrophe every year? Um, and then we come to uh, the new norm, the turning point of 2018. And 18, 19 and 20 have all got things in common. But I'm going to pause there from uh, the pricing and the marketplace uh, for, for a second and uh, go about it in uh, another way and uh, start looking at about how prices get set in the first place. I see some of you are drinking some nice wines tonight, but um, uh, I'm just having a, a cup of Wu Yi Oolong to get me through uh, this hour together. Right, um, so how to set prices. The actual cost of making wine is not huge. It's going to cost you more in Burgundy than it is down in the Languedoc, uh, but it's um, not going to uh, be a total massive difference. I would estimate that the very basic cost of producing a bottle of wine is, if it's produced in some volume, three to four euros a bottle, it's going to cost you more for small volume lots if you're very careful about your yields, if you have a much bigger team working in the um, vineyards which you're running organically, maybe with high trellising, etc., etc., etc. So um, yeah, so on uh, uh, on that basis, you can end up with a cost which is clearly higher. On top of that, you might want to do fancy bottles. Heavy bottles nowadays not so much in favour for good reasons, um, but you may have spent a bit more on your bottles. You might have ultra long corks, uh, fancy labels, and the rest of it. A, cork, a, a top cork is going to cost you uh, about one euro twenty to one euro fifty a bottle. So all these things have to be factored in. But it's hard to see how you're going to get much above ten or absolute maximum twenty euros of your cost, excluding whatever you're going to spend on marketing, excluding how much money you want to keep for yourself, and excluding costs of your grapes or costs of your vineyards. And this is uh, uh, quite important. Um, I see there's a bit of gossip going on. Who's picked bottom Morachet? Uh, I know Lafont picked his Morachet on Wednesday. Michael, I don't know if DRC have picked theirs, uh, but I believe they are starting to try and pick a little bit earlier than uh, they used to do. Right, so um, back, to, back to the main topic. Um, and it's actually quite important, I think, to avoid the moral righteousness sort of how dare either a producer put their prices up or a merchant take such a big margin or something else. Uh, it's really complex, the interplay between all these things and what works for one person doesn't work for another. So, um, you know, 
uh, I will try and avoid any moral indignation. Easy for me to do now that I'm no longer in the food chain, but uh, I can't claim that I always avoided it in the past. So the cost of your grapes is really important. Now you may say, but most of these guys who I'm interested in uh, are not buying grapes because they are domains in their own right, so they own the vineyards. Fine, but firstly, they may only recently have bought the vineyards and the vineyards have sold at exceptionally high prices and it's just impossible to see how they can possibly be amortized in any sensible time frame. Secondly, uh, they may in fact be vineyards which even though they appear to be domain, quoted as domain, they belong to family members to whom um, the person running the domain now has to pay a fermage or rental agreement. The rental agreements are set uh, outside, sort of officially, and, they, and broadly speaking, they're set against the value of barrels of wine per hectare, typically four barrels, sometimes five barrels of wine per hectare. Uh, the cost of that you're supposed to um, uh, pay as your rental. And that is influenced by the cost of the land. Um, even if this land hasn't been bought or sold recently, but there is an established costing for that land. So recently, prices of grapes have absolutely gone through the roof. And that's not to do with Mr. X, who, who is your cuddly guy who you like to go and get the wine from. Uh, it's to do with somebody else who might own that land, even if it's a family member. But nobody wants to get paid less than the next guy. Uh, some domains for their bottle product, they don't necessarily look around and see what their neighbor's doing, but there is an established price per uh, um, uh, volume of grapes, which is pretty much the same for everybody, though um, some people maybe get a small premium, but broadly speaking, it's the same for everybody. And I was having a conversation uh, a few years back with um, a vigneron in, uh, in the Cote de Beaune, white wines, and saying, look, your price has gone up by 40% over the last four vintages, and it's too much. Our customers, are, they don't like it. White burgundy is not as popular as red at the moment. Uh, you know, how can you justify putting them up by 40%? You're a domain, you know, you haven't had to buy the grapes. And she replied back to me, well, actually, yes, I do have to, because they are all on rental contracts, uh, contracts with family members. And she went away, and next time I saw her, she said, look, I've done it, and actually, my, um, uh, Fermage, my rental contracts have gone up by 45%, not just 40, in that same period. So there is more going on behind the scenes. Plus, of course, there's inheritance. Um, if you don't sort it in advance, death duties can be really penal in France. But even if you do sort it in advance, uh, they are based around the evaluation of the land. And given that, people from outside have been paying exceptionally high prices for bits of land. So that little bit of musny that Favely bought, um, two ouvres it was, which is enough for just about a barrel of wine. Yes, a barrel of wine, certainly. Um, they paid uh, 50 million euros for that. I mean, it's uh, unbelievably uh, expensive. And, and you can just imagine if you try and work the maths on that, how you're going to amortize 300 bottles a year against 50 million. Uh, that's, I beg your pardon, I think they paid, um, they paid less than that, I, uh, but it worked out at 50 million a hectare, I think, sorry, apologies. Um, um, even so, uh, you know, that, that's uh, a vast price for a piece of land. Um, for the first time, instead of certain parts of Burgundy, the vineyards being pulled out so they could build houses, one or two of the Grand Crus have actually got houses built on land inside the Grand Cru, and you could argue that it would be worth your while to knock the houses down and plant grapes, and, uh, and that would be a better return on your money. Um, so you've got these various uh, multiplying uh, factors. <laughs> it's also true that the um, small, the domains all decided that they would play at being negotiations as well, and so many of them have done this, you're familiar with it, where as well as their own wines, they now uh, either add a bit of volume to a cuvee they already make, or they add some extra cuvees uh, through buying grapes. 
it used to be that they could do that comfortably, buy the grapes at a reasonable price, and be able to offer the wine sensibly. But now, the cost of the grapes they're buying in is so expensive that they actually have to charge quite often more than they would for their own wines, unless they put the price up for their own wines. Now, it's a little bit of um, uh, uh, a cliche, if you like, but if we say that in Bordeaux, it's a city built on a wide estuary, it's been a great trading port, and the whole ethos behind Bordeaux is about trading and things. So they are, most, in most instances, very keen that their wine should trade at a high price. And they love it if they see uh, on secondary markets the price going through the roof. Uh, bragging rights to the neighbours and the opportunity to put the price up themselves next time round. Uh, equally, if they get the price wrong, given how much they're selling, it was one year uh, in the Bordeaux Prima um, system when Aubryon came out first at the first gross, and in the end they came out 100 euros per bottle less than the other first gross. Normally they're banded fairly close together. And if you multiply, I don't know, 15, 20,000 cases times 12 bottles times 100 euros a bottle, you can see that it costs them an awful lot of money. It's understandable that that should be a commercial um, system operating in Bordeaux. In Burgundy, people see themselves as inheriting their vineyard land from their parents, passing it on to their children. Uh, occasionally things get sold up. Uh, there has been a little bit more changing of hands of some top domains in recent times. But mostly that's not happening. Um, and mostly people are wishing to keep the uh, patrimoine, the patrimony, uh, intact for future generations. And, and that concerns them more, um, at least for a, a significant period now. Uh, there has uh, been an e easily enough profit for the people with vineyards in the top villages um, that they haven't got to worry about where their next uh, meal is coming from or probably their next car or helicopter or aeroplane or whatever else. But uh, they're doing pretty well. But there aren't that many of them who are actively, as far as I can see, really trying to maximise their price. Sure, you'll be able to point to some. Equally, you can point to some people in Bordeaux who want to keep the prices reasonable so they can keep selling it to uh, the same clients. Um, but now, and it's taking them a little bit of time, now the growers are getting to hear about things like Wine Searcher, LiveX, Seller Tracker, and so on and are beginning to see what the prices are in the secondary markets and beginning to say, well, how did our price of, let's call it 100, get to this price of, let's call it 1,000? Who's making the money and why are they making it? And uh, what, what should we do about it? Some of them have said, we don't necessarily want to put our prices up ourselves because we know quite a few people we're selling to. We know these people. We've, we've sold to them privately for, for years and our fathers to their fathers. We know these guys are drinking the wines and if we put the price up by two or three or five times, then they're not gonna be able to drink them anymore. And these are people who we know get appreciation out of our wines we want it to continue that way. Um, and for example, those great Chablis domains, Ravenel and Dovisa, have got a policy of selling a great deal into the on trade in France but the restaurants who will respect their pricing, but on civilized margins, and the consumer can go and get it in the restaurant, often for quite a lot less than what is the market price on wine searcher. Um, they're not alone in that, but they're two excellent examples. So I know that a group of them got together um, over the last year and have started looking at it. And one of them called me up and said, can you explain the mechanics of how the pricing gets out to this final secondary price and how much of it is being sold at that. Well, I wouldn't necessarily want to tell tales out of school, but you can give a rough idea. A bit depends on how many levels of intermediaries there are. Um, some merchant importers will be buying direct from the producer, some will be buying through an uh, intermediary, a broker based in the region. That makes sense if you're coming from further away, you maybe don't speak French all that well, uh, you can't easily travel quite so often to the region, which of course is even more true now. 
um, and you're in a country which has an enormous number of uh, complicated pieces of legislation that have to be mean the paperwork has got to be got exactly right. So it is clearly more complicated to ship wines to the US where you've got to get that paperwork right. Uh, you've got the three tier system imported distributor retailer uh, and you currently you've got the 25% um, perhaps until November, perhaps longer, who knows. Um, so, uh, you know, that's all uh, to be taken into account. Uh, when I started in the UK, amazingly enough to be an importer, I didn't, I never had a wine license of any sort, never acquired one, as long as I was selling a minimum of 12 bottles to anybody. Uh, there was no licensing, no paperwork at all, apart from making sure I, I paid the relevant uh, taxes. Um, and very, all around the world, different countries have got different ways of approaching it. But you may have a margin in Burgundy, and you will have, as a consumer, margins uh, within the hierarchy of the distribution system in your country, plus, of course, local taxes. Um, but let us say that the merchant has behaved honestly and has put a standard margin on the wine and the taxes on the wine, and off it goes. And now with all these things, it is less than half as much again from the original 100. So um, with, if we, it's 135, 140, as opposed to the original 100. And yet, a week later, it's trading at 600, and then after that, at 1,000. So the importer scratches their head and says, are we doing the right thing? Um, or are we just giving several hundred units of price worth to our private customers, some of whom we can trust to drink it, some of whom we can trust to drink it with us, in fact, uh, but others of whom may uh, flip it. So there is a tendency amongst uh, the intermediaries in the trade to increase their margins not so that they're getting right up close to that mythical 1,000 level, but so that they're somewhere in between. Um, and is that the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do? I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's hard. It, it, it clearly upsets the people who are used to be getting it at the um, much lower prices, uh, and who may or may, not know, may or may not know the pricing from the uh, original domain. And is it fair that the middleman is getting lots of the money uh, instead of the producer. So uh, it's tricky calls, so there isn't an absolute here. The other factor to take into account is that how much is being traded at this mythical thousand? The answer is there could be one case up there that fails to trade at that, and it's very possible that a good percentage change hands uh, was originally sold at 150 and some were sold at 200, 250, but really only a very small percentage was sold beyond 500. We don't know different cases, different circumstances, uh, everything can change. Um, but it was also has been true that the producers have typically sold to their private customers. Some don't have them, some have stopped taking on new ones, uh, some are trying to get rid of the ones that they did have, others continue to do it. But what I think we are now seeing is that uh, producers who are really sought after have significantly changed their price to, certainly to new and perhaps to existing private customers to try to make the difference between the private customer getting it from them and the difference between the market price, trying to reduce that, that difference. Um, again, I said, let's, let's avoid any, any sort of moral indignation on this because it really is not easy. And several of them have discussed with me and said, we don't quite know what to do, which is the right way to go. Um, and, I, and I do have some sympathies for that. Uh, Michael has asked if the US tariffs are affecting pricing. Uh, clearly they must, uh, to some extent. Um, there are ways not completely around it. I think some producers have said, okay, we will share the, uh, the bad news. So we will make a discount just to the US market. Some, have, uh, some intermediaries have also taken cuts in, in their margins and the consumer's probably paying a bit more. Um, in addition, there might be an option of, uh, it's a gamble of course, because you don't know if suddenly those margins will go right up, the tariff will go right up, but 
some uh, US importers might be holding their stock still in France and uh, gambling that they will be able to ship a little bit later on and, uh, and not have to pay that 25%. So my speciality, I've never been involved commercially in the uh, American market, so I can't tell you more than that. But of course, if you've got to pay 25% more than the next guy, uh, that's not great news. Uh, right, so um, so we've got these um, potentially very high secondary market prices, which have been affecting the primary pricing. Um, and different producers have um, had different takes on this. Some have said, wonderful, let's take as much as we can for ourselves. Probably not many of those, and you can probably guess who they are. Um, some of them have utterly, totally hated it. Uh, I'm thinking of um, two friends who have domains next door to each other in Chambon Musny, both of whom are quite upset by seeing the, the sort of speculative side of what's happening to their wines. Um, one of whom, of course, took the marvellous step from 2013 onwards of just re removing his Musny from the marketplace, saying, I'm not prepared to sell it and see it be sold almost instantly at hugely inflated prices and for people to be drinking it almost instantly when you know, a three-year-old wine from Musini, uh, that's a travesty. So maybe this year he'll offer the 2013 for the first time, but uh, he's been sitting on, and I think up to 20 barrels of 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, uh, all the way through. And he's not doing it in order that he can charge a much higher price when it is released. That's not at all in the mindset. Um, good, so, or, or less good. Um, so it is affecting people uh, in different ways, but um, clearly most of the Burgundians are unset, upset if they hear that somebody has been actively profiteering in their wine. It isn't why they made it in the first place. So we're, we're getting up now to, um, to the present day. Um, so Understandably, in those really difficult years of short vintages, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, prices went up. Some of the Grand Cru's went up enormously uh, because producers felt they could. I felt a lot sorrier for people in, let's say, Southern Le Bone, the village that got badly hit by the storms of different sorts. And they really struggled because at their level, wines are just being drunk for, uh, sorry, purchased for drinking. Uh, and if the price goes up by more than a euro or two euros a bottle, then the consumer walks away and chooses something else. And yet they desperate, really, they needed to double their prices if they were going to uh, reach break even. It was a very, very tough time. And uh, my thoughts go out to them. Along comes 2017. A decent crop in white, bumper crop in red, uh, best for a long, long time in volume terms, pretty good in quality as well, excellent in, in white quality. Thank goodness. Uh, I thought prices would come down, they didn't. I then felt, okay, well, maybe that's fair enough because they were recouping a little bit of the fat which got sliced off the bones over the last five years. Can't really grudge them getting it back in 2017. Along comes 2018. This time it's a really big crop in white and still a fairly sizable crop in red. Uh, not as big as 17 for most people, but, but bigger than anything for several years beforehand. Um, prices may be going to come down because that's two years in a row with a big crop. Um, but no, and justified, if it is justified by people saying, well, this is a really good crop for the red wines and a pretty good crop for the white wines. Uh, so it didn't happen. Now, I don't think the producers have necessarily perceived it, uh, depending on how good their communication is with their various importers. But I do know that it was a little bit of a tougher sell at the premier stage 2018, partly because the samples weren't showing well. It was a higher alcohol vintage, uh, it was a hot year, um, acidities were a bit lower, there was a risk of either slightly... The samples effectively didn't show well, they showed a little bit stewed, some of them may be a bit bacterial or a bit volatile, in ways which were clearly less good than what I and other critics were tasting in the barrel cellars. Um, there are some wines which were definitely doubtful, uh, but other domains where what we were tasting seemed to be clean and fine. I mean, yes, obviously a richer year, but we didn't pick up spoilage, 
whereas the samples showed in, in London hadn't traveled so well and, and people were getting a bit worried. So there may have been some resistance to 2018. And now we have 2019. And what's that going to uh, be like? What's going to happen in the marketplace? Still guesswork, but let's talk first a little bit about the, uh, the vintage character. And, uh, and 20, 2020 falls into the same pattern. So, so I've, I've pulled up for myself a little chart of the differences uh, between the three. Um, so 2018, you had a really wet winter beforehand, which contributed to uh, a decent water table, which meant that despite the subsequent drought, you got lots of juice in the grapes. 2019 was a very dry winter. So in fact, uh, another hot year again, and this time there was very little juice in the grapes and yields were quite definitely down. At the top end, they were probably down 30%, overall, maybe only 15%, uh, but there were probably some um, big volume places where the excess in 18 had been sent away for distill distillation. And so in 2019, the shortfall didn't seem to be as bad. 2020, it's a wet winter again, like before, uh, like in 2018. And again, we are finding a bit more juice than expected than uh, in the grapes. And it's a bigger crop than 19, but won't reach 18 size. <clears throat> no frost in 18, no frost in 20. 19, there was a little bit of frost uh, around, or at least enough of a cold period at that end to limit the crop again. Early flowering in 2018, which meant very early season, a sort of intermediate, still earlier than the past norm um, in 2020. And in 2019, it was a later flowering and a less good flowering, which also limited the crop. Um, then all three summers have been hot in parts, uh, with a real feeling of drought in 18 and 20, and to some extent 19. Uh, actually, 20 has probably had the least high peaks of temperature, but it's been warm and dry and it felt so dry in the third year in a row, just out there and if you in your kitchen garden or if you're an agricultural farmer, or if you're walking in the woods up on the top of the hills with this very little topsoil, it feels much worse this year in 2020 than the previous two. Um, and in 2019, was, uh, I was up in Chablis at the end of June and the temperature hit 40 degrees up there. Really hot at the end of July as well uh, and in August. Um, so I don't think 19 is a less hot vintage than 18 or 20. But there was a little bit of rainfall which definitely did some good and was much needed and not present in 2020. Um, there was no rot in 2018, no rot in 2019, no rot in 2020. Three years with not even a sniff of it around. Um, you got probably the highest alcohols in 2018. 2019 and 20, they seem to be a little bit lower, but that may be also to do with people having learned from 2018 and making slightly different picking decisions. Um, so, um, and in 2018, I was definitely finding some Brettanomyces in certain cellars, uh, some volatility, uh, volatile acidity as well, um, and some stewed uh, wines, but very many that weren't. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't want to be negative about 2018 across the board because it was just uh, more than a handful, but a proportion of wines which you would need to avoid, and the rest could be really, really good. Uh, and the whites did show well. And a huge crop for white, correct crop for reds. Uh, I'll jump to 2020 and then we'll come back and focus on 2019. So in 2019, um, sorry, in 2020 rather, those people who've already picked, who went out early, they traded off having the right sugar levels to get wines at low 13s in alcohol, so have still extremely good acidity with, um, in whites, the grapes, uh, taste ripe as well. It looks really exciting in white. In reds, maybe the skins aren't completely ripe, uh, but that's that's an, a necessary trade-off, if you like. Um, but it looks to be a, a good, maybe very good vintage in red, might be exceptional in white. Obviously way too early. What I don't know is how uh, the Cote Nui will fare. Most people are just starting uh, and we have had a little bit of rainfall now. As long as your vines are still 
fully at work, um, they will be able to make use of that rainfall. But there are certain vines in more arid vineyards where the leaves have been dying off, they stop pumping anything good into the grapes and the rain is therefore irrelevant there. So now, but I can see parallels between uh, 18 and 20 and, um, and then we got 19 in between, which ought to have been very similar and possibly isn't. At this stage in tasting, I have done a fair amount of Maconnet, Chalonnet, Chablis, one or two people in the Cote d'Or, but obviously the really big period comes in October, November. And I don't know whether uh, all the critics are gonna be able to get to Burgundy with various different uh, quarantine uh, decisions going on, uh, which may become stricter, but basically I'm gonna be based here. And so I will be able to get around and, and taste everything uh, as, as per usual. Chablis was very interesting because you've got a position that you have uh, another very hot year, like 2018. You have a much smaller crop, which should make things more intense and more exaggerated. We did have some frost in Chablis in 19, um, but not too much, fortunately. Um, and the harvest was about a week to 10 days later. In fact, throughout Burgundy, the harvest in 19 is later than either 18 or 20. And that would seem to suggest that the wine should have been higher in alcohol and lower in acidity. And what I was finding, it's a mixed picture. And throughout Burgundy, again, it is a mixed picture. There isn't a definite uh, overall vintage character. But quite a lot of people in, in Chablis returned slightly lower uh, alcohol, sugar levels, therefore alcohol levels in 2019. The acidity kept together. I thought we might have another 2009 in which the Chablis character was hidden. What you've got is a very clear marine Chablis character, but you've also got fruit aromatics of a ripe vintage. So you've got some of those musky peachy notes. Um, and in the Macanay, you've got, if you've got any of the clone Muscatet Chardonnay, uh, that shows to uh, a greater degree. So you've got some aromatics which are clearly of a warm ripe year, but you've retained the tension of a classic year. So, <clears throat> uh, and in general, people have a good opinion for the 2019 whites in the Cape Door too. So a couple of people, um, I've decided throughout this talk that I haven't actually been mentioning, or no, I did mention Rabineau and Dovisa, uh, but in general, I've not been mentioning individual producers' names, and I think I'll keep it that way for now. But I can think of a couple of people I've already, already visited who had a much more difficult time in 19 than they did in 18. But the majority in the Cote d'Or have reported far fewer problems, uh, less bacterial spoilage, better balance in the wines, and less volatility in 19 compared to 18. Uh, I've, I've, the reason for the um, problems in 18 came through stuck fermentations and most people have reported that the fermentations went through better and the malolactic fermentations happened later, uh, so more classically in 19 and 18. On the face of it, we'll clearly have a vintage which is going to count as one of the, uh, as a hot, uh, not a, hot, a warm style, a sunny style, and that may not be everybody's cup of tea for Burgundy, in which case you might want to buy back into the 17s and 14s and 13s. But if you are um, amongst those who are entirely happy with uh, this slightly richer style that is inevitably, inevitably going to come from the warmer years, then you've got three good vintages to play with. And probably the feeling is that 19 will be put above 18. Uh, I'm not going to say it any more strongly than that, until I've done the really in-depth tastings that I'll do through October and November. But that's at the outset. And it's a smaller crop. Bingo, this sounds like higher prices. Or will people take into account the um, various crises that we're facing in 2020? So what is the situation in the marketplace at the moment? Um, obviously, uh, people haven't been able to travel. Uh, restaurants have been really hit. The on trade in every country has uh, suffered very badly. And uh, happily for those professionals involved, anybody selling uh, wine direct to the consumer 
has reported a big uplift in sales. And during the worst of lockdown, uh, as soon as they're allowed to able to deliver and allowed to deliver, one or two people had to close for a few days because their systems couldn't cope with the volume of orders. Uh, huge volumes of wine were being sent out to private uh, customers and many professionals have been able to stay afloat, if not even do a little bit better this year because of that. Um, whether this message is clear to the producers, uh, some of whom report that yes, actually they've been, there was a hiatus for two months, but they've sort of caught up since. Others have said, no, what we lost in those two or three months will stay lost. Depends on exactly where their sales are focused. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to know. Um, it's worth pointing out that one of the reasons why Burgundians have been happy to put their prices up where they have done so is that a lot of them now travel abroad and they're absolutely lionized when they go to Hong Kong, London, New York, wherever. Uh, and they meet all these consumers who say, wow, so wonderful to meet you, Mr. X and the Monsieur X. And uh, I love your wine and uh, oh, you make such brilliant wine uh, and we can't get it. You know, there's, there's not enough allocation to go around. So the producers then come home feeling like a million dollars and thinking, well, uh, you know, our prices can't be too high if everybody is trying to get more of it and, and can't source it. So there has been a little bit of that effect playing on uh, producers' pricing. Now, they're not seeing customers this year in the same way, so maybe that factor will be a little bit less present. Uh, I expect people may be watching auction prices, and I thought that auction prices would definitely take a knock over these last few months. I thought people would be sitting on their hands, nobody would be quite sure where the world's going at the moment, and that we would see the prices for the finest wines fall back. Now, uh, this isn't my specialist area. One or two of you might uh, uh, be more involved in it than me and put something up on the chat. But um, yes, I think in general terms, uh, prices have held up pretty firm for a lot of people. There are changes in who's up and who's down, who's really sought after and who's falling away a bit, but something along that. Um, so beginning to see one or two comments, uh, people who uh, get the direct allocations and uh, with what their allocations are like and what the prices are like. Um, I haven't done much asking around yet because I know that most producers won't start thinking about pricing until they've got this vintage out of the way, finished the vinification, uh, taken a look at what this year's crop size finally is, and then they will maybe start um, playing a bit more with, uh, well, preparing their, their prices. So, um, Yes, it's, um, it's, it's still all to play for. My guess is that we won't see prices go down with a smaller crop. My hope is that we won't see prices go up, but there are a few people, of course, who are repositioning themselves. Uh, I was about to mention a couple of names, but uh, I'll stick to the policy of not. Uh, but those of you who are following some top people, you will know exactly who I mean. And, um, Certainly also, uh, you can have um, uh, other family reasons. Um, I criticized a particular grower uh, one year. I, uh, I think it was um, 2005 vintage when he came to London to show his wines off. And I said, look, your prices have gone up several times by a big margin in the last few years, since we first started buying your wines five years ago. And, you know, it, okay, 05, it will work. We can sell 05s, but it's just got to stop. And he was rather taken aback by this, but I subsequently learned that he was actually, uh, he was building up a war chest in order to buy his siblings out uh, so that he could have the whole of the family property and give them the correct money uh, for the vineyards. So there can be things like that. There can be people also building up a war chest in order to uh, make acquisitions of other vineyards. Um, but in general, let's hope for something approaching stability. Uh, I don't know it will be different in different countries, whether the 20, how well the 2018s sold through, but merchants everywhere are pretty wary about sitting on stock. So it may well be that the financial people will say, if you haven't sold the 18s through, you've got to be careful about buying 19s. Um, we'll know more later on.
And what I think I will try and do, whether it's through here or through 67 Pound Mail, is do some much more specific 2019 Zooms at the end of December or the first week in January, when at least in the UK, this is the moment when all the wines come to market and we can talk much more about the harvest 2019 in real detail. And I will have tasted from everybody and will have, have really fine-tuned my thinking. Right, my hour is up, but I will, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll stay, stay with us for a little while longer. I'm just going to check through, um, uh, there's one question to look at and check through one or two uh, of the chats, see if there are things to answer. So do send in more questions now. Um, seem to be some kind of variation from year to year, depending on quality and yields. Bigger variations from producer to producer, correct? With the usual investment grade, hateful term, I agree. Use is going for eye-watering prices. It's a major driver of prices, means supply demand and resellability as opposed to drinking quality. Well, yes, I fear so. And there are some of those investment grade producers. Um, well, some of them want to put the prices up themselves. Some of them keep their prices down, but somehow have got into a complete paradox is that they want to see uh, their prices being really, really, their wines being really successful and they consider high prices elsewhere. Uh, being a sign of that success and others the high prices have been uh, the intermediates the secondary trade taking the prices higher against the will of the producers so it is really a, a, a supply and demand thing um, drinkability comes into it uh, drinking quality comes into it in the sense that the reason they are the blue chip investment grade is that almost everybody uh, has a similar opinion about how good they are. I mean, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to say that um, uh, you know it's not like that. But then you do come and you drink your bottle from somebody in Chevrolet Chambord, Chambord Musnier, produced beginning with R. And uh, yes, the wines just are fabulous. So, so anyway, um, right. Um, we're told that dis many distributors in the US are absorbing some of the tariff impacts, well that's good to hear, uh, and also general that your taxes in Turkey, 150%, hear me, of course they used to be 80% in Hong Kong, then 40%, then, then nothing. Um, yeah, yes there are some people, we've got a quite, someone pricing more than double between 12 and 16 and then jumped again in 17. I mean, many of us have got finite amounts of money, and even if we have a little bit more, we're just not comfortable paying that much more. Other people have got easily enough money, so yes, you, of course you want to pay less, but but actually you you have the wherewithal to pay more, and there are enough people with such wealth that actually the cost of a bottle of wine isn't all that relevant, and if enough people are out there just wanting to get hold of it, then that explains why the prices have got quite so high. One phrase I hear quite regularly is I've got such, such wine and I can't afford to drink it. Well, personally, as far as I'm concerned, what I paid for it dictates whether I can afford to drink it. And if I can afford to pay for it, I can afford to drink it. Uh, sometimes, you know, you think, oh gosh, I'm drinking what could be sold for an awful lot of money. But if I bought it, it's because I want to drink it. And uh, I'm going to endeavor to stick to my rule of <laughs> if I bought it, I'll drink it or share it with other people. Good. Well, look, I've covered that um, as much as I can. Um, uh, there's one more question and then I can see a, what looks like a tricky one on chat. Right. It's, if I had a financial interest in Louis Latour, say, what would you do? Don't average wine such a prices of Cotton Chalamet Wine Louis Latour, 100 pounds, Bonny de Matry, 200 pounds, Rostery uh, Loire, 4,000 pounds. Sack the winemaker, employ I know on to any cost, sell your stake. Well, um, Louis Latour is a very family-run business and they make the wines that they want to make. And uh, as long as they find ways that they can continue to pass that business on, I don't know what outside shareholding they do have, um, but it, clearly they aren't trying to get up into that very, very superstar rarefied atmosphere and the very few uh, bottles in existence from Costa Rica, Loire, Arnaud, etc. 
uh, but they know what they want to make and that's what they're making and uh, they have enough people to buy the wines that they do make but not enough people to uh, buy them at secondary market prices which are much higher so that's all that I can really say about that. Um, I'm not expecting any changes imminently from that particular address. Great, um, thank you very much. I hope that if you aren't already drinking something nice, you will later today. Um, I haven't, uh, haven't yet been into the cellar to choose a bottle, but I'll try and make it something, something good. I think, we're having, I think we might be having Merges tonight, so it probably won't be a grand burgundy, but uh, I shall enjoy and uh, we'll be in touch again before our next Zoom webinar. And I will try and do on this channel, the JMIB um, channel, we'll try and do in interesting topics um, uh, without tasting wines, but interesting themes. And uh, if you have any suggestions, do let me know. But for now, I should say goodbye and thank you to Scott behind the scenes who's been hosting tonight's webinar. Bye.